Welcome to another little rabbit hole. A few months ago, I played the Melbourne Jazz Festival. I played Natural Machines, a project where I've written computer algorithms that improvise with me. So there's some math involved. After one of the concerts, a man named Joel Smithard introduced himself, and he asked me if I was familiar with the Pythagorean Tetractus. I said, not really. So he explained to me, he said, the Pythagorean Tetractus is the figure that you're looking at right now. And the way you get it is you start with the number one, and when you go diagonally down to the left, you multiply by two. One times two is two, times two is four, times two is eight, and so on. And when you go down diagonally to the right, you multiply by three. One times three is three, times three is nine, times three is 27, and so on. And you do the same for the numbers in the interior of the figure. And now the reason he brought it up is he said, if you play these numbers, because these are just numbers, right? If you play them as frequencies, which is what you're hearing right now, you will eventually hear the major scale. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. Um, but I put it aside until the last two days when I wrote this computer program that you're seeing right now. So the first thing I did over the last two days was to look up the Pythagorean Tetractus. And according to Wikipedia, it actually doesn't involve numbers. Uh, it's just this figure right here. It's an arrangement of dots in this particular pattern, and there are only four levels to it. There's one dot at the top, then there are two, then there are three, and then there are four, and that's it. This is the Pythagorean Tetractus, and it was a mystical symbol to the Pythagoreans, who were essentially a religious sect devoted to logic and mathematics, and who were instrumental in developing mathematics, and particularly instrumental in the development of the mathematics of music, because they discovered that pitches that sound good together have frequencies related by whole number ratios. So anyway, this mystical symbol was associated with planetary motions and with music. So I modified my program a little so we could see it just as dots, and here you have a legitimate Pythagorean tetractus. Which, by the way, is something you've seen before because it's how bowling pins are arranged. But let's bring our numbers back. The Pythagoreans discovered that if you start with a certain frequency, this is 128 hertz, and you multiply it by two, you go up an octave. So in music, this is considered the same note, just an octave above. And while we're at it, what is this note? 512 hertz. To me, this sounds like a C. And if I look at this handy list of the frequencies of the notes on the piano here, I see that middle C is 261.6 hertz. So that's pretty close to 256 hertz. So 261 hertz is what you get if you tune your A to 440 hertz, which is the international standard. And here we're just a little bit below that. So this is a slightly flat middle C. And in fact, let's look at what our A is if our C is at 256. There's our A, and it's a 432. And 432 is a pitch standard that actually has some popularity. There are people who love tuning their A to 432. And so 432 is the A that you arrive at if you just start with one hertz. If you start with an oscillation of once per second, and you just create notes from it by multiplying by two and by three, you will eventually get your A at 432. Okay, so anyway, when we go diagonally down to the left by multiplying by two, we get octaves. We go up and down in octaves. Okay, now what happens when we go diagonally down to the right? Then we're multiplying by three. So this, 27 hertz, this actually is the lowest note on the piano. That's the low A on the piano, and you can see it here. This is the low A, and it's 27 and a half hertz. So again, we're just a little bit flat here at exactly 27 hertz. This is low A, multiply it by three. We get E, we get E an octave and a half above the low A. And this is another thing that the Pythagoreans discovered, which is that if you multiply by three, you go up a perfect 12th. And here we are, continuing to go up in perfect twelfths until we're way beyond our range of hearing. Of 
course, I can do this anywhere in the figure, right? I could start from here. So Joel said that we would hear the major scale. And he said that we would do this by listening to these numbers in sequence. So what that means is my program is going to search all the numbers in this figure, and it's going to give us the next biggest one. So here we are listening to this figure in ascending numerical order. OK, already I noticed something. This is a pentatonic scale based on C. Very clean pentatonic scale. Let's keep going. That's a pentatonic scale, but we added the seventh. We added the B. OK, let's keep going. Same thing again, but an octave up. Let's keep going. And that was a Lydian scale. We've already arrived at a seven note scale, and it happens to be Lydian. C, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C. Now, Joel said we would get the major scale, but all we need to do to hear the major scale is start on G below. G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G. Perfect major scale. Okay, but let's go back to listening to it starting from C. Another Lydian scale. Now we're going to hear it gradually add notes to the scale. You hear that? That's a D flat. But already we're getting to the top of our range of hearing. So what I've done is I've written a little algorithm that will octave displace these notes, meaning move them up and down by an octave. So just multiplying these numbers by two or dividing by two until they're in our comfortable range of hearing. So in other words, we're still hearing these frequencies, but octave reduced to our range of hearing. So I'm gonna turn that on now. And why don't we start at the top and listen to this again with octave reduction. Now you can really hear how the octave from one C to the next is getting gradually filled in with pitches. At first, there's only a few, then we get the pentatonic scale, then we get the Lydian scale, and now we're filling in that Lydian scale with chromatic pitches. You hear that D flat, and we have an E flat, an A flat, we have a B flat that we just passed. Still no perfect fourth though, no F. And there's the F. So this is a perfect chromatic scale. C, D flat, D, E flat, E, F, F sharp, G, A flat, A, B flat, B, and C. What happens if we keep going? Another excellent chromatic scale. And we're back at C here, and this C is at 524,288 hertz. Again, we're octave reducing so that we can hear it. And what happens if we keep going? Oh boy, for the first time, we have a note that doesn't fit within this 12 note scale that we know and love. And that one is at 531,441. Listen to the discrepancy between these two notes. This one on the right is a lot sharper than the one on the left. So what's going on here? We arrived at this number over here, that C, by going up in octaves from one, right? Okay, so if I start at one and I turn my octave displacement off, We just go up in octaves, up in octaves, until we get to 524,288. I'll turn octave displacement back on. This number over here we arrived at by multiplying by 3. So what we're doing over here is stacking fifths. What we're doing over here is stacking octaves. And this is the difference between these two numbers, is stacking fifths versus stacking octaves. 
And let's, let's think about what these notes are over here. C, G, D, A, E, B, F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, and then this is a D sharp, and this is an A sharp, and this is not an F, but an E sharp, and this, my friends, is a B sharp and not a C. And that's what we're hearing here, is the difference between a B sharp and a C. So what's going on here? This is, in fact, what we call the Pythagorean comma. The Pythagorean comma is the small interval existing in Pythagorean tuning between two enharmonically equivalent notes such as C and B sharp. So here you can see a C and a B sharp. Interestingly, this B sharp, even though it's lower on the staff, is actually higher than the C. It's actually sharper than the C. And by the way, remember those, those two numbers, 531,441 versus 524,288. These two numbers were known to the ancient Greeks. In fact, Euclid himself, I was amazed when I read this, Euclid himself, the ancient Greek mathematician who lived in 300 BC, he calculated this ratio, 531,441 to 524,288 in 300 BC. Chinese mathematicians were also aware of the Pythagorean comma as early as 122 BC. So this is a, an essential problem in music and it's something that troubled people for a very long time. And um, this is what led to the emergence of tuning systems like mean tone and later well temperament, which is what Bach had a hand in developing. And then ultimately to equal temperament, which is nothing more than an attempt to smooth out the difference between these two numbers. So how do we go about smoothing out that difference? Well, here in the top row, we have multiplication by two. So we have our octaves, about one, two, four, eight, all the way until we get to 524,288. In the lower row, we have multiplication by three. So these are our fifths. And we've got one, three, nine, 27, and so on, until we get to 531,441. And as you can see, there's a discrepancy here. These two lines don't match up. So equal temperament is gonna be the process of smoothing out these fifths, of shrinking them by exactly the right amount so that by the time we've gone through all 12, we end up in the same place. So let's see what that looks like and what that sounds like. Here's our B sharp, and we're now gonna move it down, and we're gonna move the other fifths down proportionally to match the C. Let's listen to the cycle of fifths both ways. Here it is in equal temperament. And here it is in Pythagorean tuning. It's quite different, it's subtle, but really quite different. Back to equal temperament. And Pythagorean. So as you can hear, the difference is subtle enough that you can just about get away with it. Those fifths still sound pretty good. Thirds actually don't sound that great, but that's a story for another day. The big advantage is that our B sharp is now equal to our C, and this allows us to play in any key we want without having to retune our instruments. So that's the rabbit hole that I went down when thinking about what Joel referred to as the Pythagorean tetractus, which in fact is not exactly that. This is a Pythagorean tetractus. And I think ultimately what is really fun about this is to be reminded that what we take for granted in music, which is the existence of the chromatic scale and also the subsets of the chromatic scale, like the major scale and even the pentatonic scale, we get all of these by taking one and multiplying it by twos and by threes. 
I think it's incredible how simple all this is and how this total simplicity ends up giving rise to the infinite possibilities of music. Thanks for listening.